The final lecture in this chapter deals with something, with, with something called molecular orbital theory. Now, if you recall, valence bond theory is um, great at giving us the, the geometry of a molecule. We can predict the shape of, of, of most any molecule by using valence bond theory. But it does not always predict magnetic properties of molecules. correctly. For example, the molecule oxygen and bromine are both, so, so uh, oxygen gas, uh, bromine liquid, um, are, those are both paramagnetic. which means, if you remember, paramagnetic means they have unpaired electrons. Well, how does that happen if we have an even number of electrons in our valence bond theory model? So they have an even number of electrons. Valence bond theory would say that there shouldn't be any unpaired electrons in those two molecules, but yet they are paramagnetic, meaning that, um, and there's one or more unpaired electrons within that molecule. So to be able to, to, to um, predict or refine valence bond theory, we're going to use something called molecular orbital theory. Molecular orbital theory, the electrons are going to be considered to be in orbitals characteristic of the molecule as a whole. As you remember with valence bond theory, we had hybrid orbitals or atomic orbitals that were overlapping to make bonds. In molecular orbital theory, we're going to make orbitals that, that, that are characteristic of the molecule as a whole, rather than having electrons in atomic orbitals like with valence bond theory. There are going to be, here's the steps that we're going to use to make this. So, so we, we, to do this. So the first step is atomic orbitals are combined to give a new set of molecular orbitals. So, so for and and uh, um, if we have two two s orbitals, for example, that will give us two molecular orbitals. If we have two s plus uh, six p orbitals, that's going to give us eight molecular orbitals. So we're going to combine these atomic orbitals, essentially mathematically, to give them a new set of molecular orbitals. The second thing we're going to do is arrange them, the molecular orbitals, 
in order of increasing energy. Then we'll place valence electrons into the orbitals. And um, you know, uh, each molecular orbital can hold two electrons, so poly exclusion principle applies. Electrons are going to fill molecular orbitals to the lowest energy first. Oop. Molecular orbitals of lowest energy first. And Hund's rule applies. Okay. And when we do these steps, we're going to get two different types of orbitals. We're going to end up with bonding orbitals. So we're combining molecular orbitals arrange them, we'll see how we'll do that, and we'll place the electrons in them. We're going to end up, when we do these steps, we're going to get bonding orbitals and something called anti-bonding orbitals. Bonding orbitals have an energy lower than uh, that of the atomic orbitals from which they are formed. Anti-bonding orbitals, oh, and with bonding orbitals, the electron density is between The nuclei. The antibonding orbitals are going to have higher energy than the atomic orbitals from which they're formed, and the electron density will be between or is not between the nuclei. So let's let's look at what this looks like from a uh, from a sort of a math perspective. Remember what we're doing here is we have atomic orbitals we're combining and so on. So let's think about what it looks like to combine atomic orbitals sort of mathematically. So we have a, a, a mathematical function that represents the atomic orbital, and this this would be for for let's say we're we're looking at the molecular orbitals for the hydrogen H two molecule. Okay, so we have two hydrogen atoms. The two hydrogen atoms each have a 1s, uh, an electron and a 1s orbital, or, or a, a, an s orbital, 1s orbital. We can add these two electrons, or, or add these two orbitals mathematically. So we have a function that represents a sphere, three-dimensional sphere, function that represents a three-dimensional sphere. We add those together and we end up with a bonding orbital. So this would be the approximate shape of adding these two orbitals together and knowing where the electrons are. So remember, the orbitals are probabilities. We're just adding two probabilities to find out, to determine where an electron would be around both of those two atoms at the same time. We can also subtract one s orbital from another s orbital. And what we end up is we end up with a low electron density region between the two atoms. And this is going to be an antibonding orbital. Remember, you said we were going to end up with a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital. So from a, from, a, from a math perspective, this is what it looks like to be able to do this. Now, um, let's look at 
this hydrogen atom from a different perspective, a diagram that would look like this. And here what we have is, so we're, so we're combining our, our orbitals to make, uh, um, we're combining our atomic orbitals to give the new set. And then remember the second part said that we're going to arrange those orbitals, the molecular orbitals, in order of increasing energy. So let's look at this. Okay, so here's a hydrogen atom, and here's another hydrogen atom. We're going to bring those together, mathematically create a bonding orbital where the energy is lower in energy than the two 1s orbitals together. Since that bonding orbital since its electron density is, 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 is in the axis of the, of the two atoms, it's a sigma bond that's made. So we're going to call it the sigma 1s orbital, or sigma 1s bonding orbital. Uh, so, so, so we're going to call it the sigma 1s orbital. That's going to indicate a bonding orbital. We're calling it the 1s orbital because it's made from two 1s orbitals from each of the hydrogen atoms that made the hydrogen molecule. So the hydrogen molecule also has an antibonding orbital. That antibonding orbital is higher in energy. Then the two orbitals would be otherwise. The star here is where the antibonding is indicated. So we call that the sigma star 1s orbital. That is an antibonding orbital. It is higher in energy than the 1s orbitals from which it came from originally. When, so we can, we can do this sort of thing with lithium atoms and other m molecules too. Let's say, for example, I'm going to take this from the textbook and show you this from the lithium atom. Remember, a lithium atom has three electrons. We bring it together. It has We have the electrons that are in the 1s orbital. Those, the Li2 molecule has electrons that are in a bonding orbital and the 1s antibonding orbital. There's another electron in each of the 2s electrons of the lithium atoms. Remember, these are the atoms here. This atoms are here. We combine the two orbitals to make bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals, the molecular orbitals. One of them is lower in energy, one of them is higher. This is the bonding, the sigma 2s bonding orbital. There are two electrons in it. Now the great thing is, is you can, this actually will give you also whether something is paramagnetic or diamagnetic. This would be diamagnetic. There are no unpaired electrons in this molecule. Things can get even more complicated if once we have um, molecules that are from the second period. So now we're, we've got molecules that are in the second period of the periodic table. So now we're making molecular orbitals out of 2p orbitals also. So this would be essentially for the N2 molecule, right? Because we have one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. This would be the nitrogen atom and a nitrogen atom, and then the nitrogen molecule. So what, what this shows us is this. So, so similarly, this is, so the 1s is already, is way down here, down below where we see the 1s is making those bonding orbitals, the molecular orbitals, antibonding molecular orbitals. The 2s is here, and then we have the 2p. There's a sigma that's formed from the two p orbitals that are directed along the internuclear axis. Remember, the p orbitals are on a Cartesian coordinate system. So essentially we have p orbitals that are arranged like this for each of the molecules that are there. 
when this orbital and this orbital mathematically combine, they're going to make a sigma bond because of the fact that the it's 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 the combination of orbitals that are directed along the internucleus. Sigma bonds are between the uh, the axes, uh, and then the sideways overlap is perpendicular to the internuclear axis. There's overlap here and here. That's going to be the pi bonds that are that are formed. Pi bonds are actually slightly lower energy, and so on. And you can see we're calling them pi bonds because of their their uh, they are not they are above and below the internuclear axis. They're called the pi 2p bonding orbitals because they're lower in energy than the 2p. And they're called the 2p because they were made from 2p orbitals. So that's an example of um, Of here, and so we, we again we could predict there are no unpaired electrons, so it'd be diamagnetic, the nitrogen atom.